Hey guys, what's up? It's Finch here. Today we're going to be going over my first of three round one World Cup games. It's going to be against my good friend Gary Oak. Right off the bat, I want to say, if you guys want to see just a battle and you don't want any backstory or team preview analysis, probably skip to about three to four minutes in. I'll try to remember to leave the timestamp down below, but if not, it'll probably be in the comments because I've got so many nice and friendly viewers that do stuff like that for me. So yeah. With that said though, first off, I want to discuss some backstory, what this game is, what it matters, and who I'm playing against, and then I'm going to go into my team as well, and then we'll get into the game. So, the World Cup of Pokemon is the biggest SSOU team tournament on Smogon this year, same deal last year, and probably, you know, in future preps as well. It's eight SSOU slots, every single region has their own team. I'm playing for US Northeast. I'm from New Jersey, so naturally that's where I fall into. I built a lot of great relationships and friendships with all of my teammates, um, it's been great um, building that rapport over the last couple of years. We ended up winning the tournament back during our first year. Then we made playoffs, but we lost. And last year, we missed it outright. So this year, you know, we're back seeking our revenge. And we're against a very strong opponent here. Gary Oak is on Team Spain, one of the stronger teams over the years. They've made playoffs many times. And I know Gary firsthand is one of the better players. So I'm really excited to play him. Funnily enough, I actually kind of drew what some people are dumbing as a death group, if you will. Gary Oak is a great player. He's been positive in SPL and Smog on Snakecraft recently. Just carving out win after win after win in a number of tiers, but particularly SSOU. I also got Taste, who is a good friend of mine and really stood out in SSOU as well, playing that above average level in SPL and Smog on Snakecraft. In addition to that, he actually won the most recent Smog on Premier League as a member of the Wolfpack. So big round of applause to him. Um, my final opponent may be a bit less well-versed in SSOU of the three, but also probably the most experienced of the three is a Loden of Team Brazil. I actually um, mentioned him in chronological order, so this upload is going to be my game against Gary Oak, as you can see here. My next upload is going to be my game against Taste, which happened the next day. So this was Friday of last week. That game was Saturday of next week. And my third and final game was against a Loden of Team Brazil, which was on Sunday of last week. Not going to spoil any of the results. We'll say I won some, I lost some. So stay tuned and find out which ones I won, which ones I lost. But I will say it was super fun playing all three of these guys. And if any of you guys are watching, thank you so much for making this group an enjoyable experience. I think that the spectators enjoyed a lot of these games. All three games were pretty close, came down to the final, um, I guess, kind of final sequences for the most part. And I'm really glad that was the case because normally these kind of like groups that are get all the hype, all the big names, because four really well-known players in this group, um, kind of have lopsided their unfortunate games. But nah, all these games are great. And we're gonna start off with the game against Gary Oak. So yeah, for those of you guys that are just popping in now, we're about three minutes. Let's talk about the team really quickly. I am known for using more bulky offense and balanced team. So I wanted to change it up, use more hyper offensive team. And I had a really cool concept on my team. I want to use a jack pack guard chomp. What is a jack pack? A jack pack is an item that makes you switch out upon taking a stat drop. Be it your own Draco Meteor, spoiler alert, it's a mix jump, dropping your special attack by two, or getting something like Intimidated or Defogged Into or even Moonblast Special Attack Drop. Things like that also make you switch out. Now, this can actually be a, a good thing or it could be a bad thing. For example, sometimes you want to click an attack into a Landorus and Intimidate makes you switch out. So I built my team to where that downside isn't actually necessarily a bad thing is I have Pokemon to abuse Landorus T coming in, but also on the flip side, if I get a Draco Meteor off into a Mandibuzz or Corviknight, it's something that I could really abuse and take advantage of given the team structure. So let's dive into how that fits my team and why I think it's a very underrated strategy. You oftentimes see things like Corviknight or Mandibuzz on balanced teams. In particular, Corviknight is a very common option right now. It's rated A plus in the viability rankings and it's one of the top five to seven Pokemon in the metagame right now. If you click Draco Meteor into it or you click Stealth Rack into it and it defogs into you, you automatically get a Jack packed out and they're never gonna really see that coming. And that brings in Magnezone for free. And yeah, a lot of the time they've been clicking U-turn into you, right? But if you click Draco on the switch, then you don't have to risk double switching. You're still clicking your strongest stab move and that opens a ton, a ton of doors. Or let's say they're not as fearful because they're specially defensive and they can defog in your face. That's fine. You're still going to get a ton of chip because defog is going to give you an automatic switch to Magnezone. You're not going to risk anything. No 50-50 mind games. Magnezone comes in for free. This also comes in handy against other Pokemon as well. For example, you could Draco Meteor into a Skarmory, predicting something else, not going for Fire Blast. You could uh, Draco Meteor into Mandibuzz and you can't trap it, but suddenly you get Weavile or Magnezone or Melmetal in to absolutely pummel it. Against Landorus T, it's really cool because you could actually lead Garchomp and oftentimes they can lead Landorus T against this team. And you get a free Weavile, which opens up the door for getting a knockoff on a valuable defensive Pokemon like Tapu Fini, Corviknight, Skarmory, 
um, Tangrowth, etc. Hit Paladon, there's a ton of Pokemon, and getting a knockoff on this team is crucial because just any damage is good damage in Hyper Offense. And in addition to this, the team has a ton of win conditions that take advantage of this strategy. When you see those physical Pokemon chipped by Mixed Garchomp, or the timely switches that it generates with Eject Pack, or trapped by things like Magnezone, trapping Corviknight, trapping Skarmory, because we are um, an expert belt Iron Defense Body Press set as well, all of a sudden Melmetal, Kartana, Weavile, and Dragonite all are able to excel. So it's a pretty cool strategy in my eyes. Anyway, I promised I wasn't going to labor too much on team preview and we just passed the five minute mark. So let's go ahead and get into the game. If I didn't make it clear enough before, I was leading Garchomp and actually the Landorus T thing came into play here right off the bat. So I'm basically getting a huge leash advantage because of that item. So I'm able to not only get a knockoff on either Clefable or Ferrothorn, but also I'm able to tell what their spread is. And if this team is physically defensive Ferrothorn, it absolutely has to be specially defensive Clefable. Checking things like Dragapult, Tapu Koko comes into the utmost importance. Even being able to switch into some other special attackers as well, such as Kyurem, can come in handy here as Weavile is not the most durable check, and Magnezone, while it can be Scarf, is going to get two equipped by Specs Ice Beam. So, a lot of things here that come into my mind, and I'm really liking the position, despite basically taking more damage from Spoiler Alert, Rocky Hump plus Iron Barb, than I took from Knockoff, as you see here. I do 28 and take 28, but this means, okay, physically defensive Ferrothorn, so I, I need that knock damage for plus two um, body press from my expert belt um, Magnezone to kill it anyway, which is cool. But also, on top of that, I, I now can kind of map out his team. If he's specially defensive Clefable, he's probably going to be a Stealth Rock variant, not a Calm Mind variant, which probably means that he's a more offensive lander of sea. Now, there are a couple ways of looking at that. It could be a uh, Sub Swords Dance set, it could be still an offensive rocker and a utility clefable with Wish or potentially uh, Heal Bell, which can make sense with uh, Dragonite being switched into things like Toxic Heatran and Scald from Slow King and whatnot. Or um, it could potentially be some weird set with Gravity or Smackdown. I didn't think that was super likely here because you already have Magnezone to trap the Pokemon that that would come into play with. So yeah, I was really expecting kind of like a Swords Dance for attack or a Sub Swords Dance Lander T and a Stealth Rock Clefable, but Utility and Offensive Rock Slanders T would have also made sense. But yeah, it kind of gives way to more piece of information than you see here. Like that knockoff basically told me what three sets were, and also the presence of Magnus on the team preview and the lack of Defog on this team kind of leads me to believe it's probably going to be, um, well, it could be Defog Landorus, but I don't think that was the case for its Offensive Landorus. So probably going to be Boots, Stewards Dance, Weavile, uh, Dragon Dance, Dragonite, and really uh hard to say what the magnezone would be at this point i guess it could have been defog dragonite technically but that wouldn't really make a ton of sense to me with magnezone support but anyway so yeah that was like despite the item really only generating 20 percent damage i feel like it actually played into my hands a ton of information inside so i was really happy with that i go magnezone here trying to get the trap but he's gonna go ahead and double switch to clefable which is a nice mid ground there it covers weavile staying in and potentially going off something like low kick but it also is able to cover the magnezone double because you don't get trapped However, he's going to be scared of a potential um, Specs Flash Cannon, and he's actually going to predict me to go for a Volt Switch into the Ferrothorn if I am choice, or otherwise just, you know, switch out because they can't be Clefable. So he is going to go to Lander's T, and I was scared of Clefable. I knew I wasn't Flash Cannon or anything like that, so I just double switched to my Metal. Unfortunately there for me, he goes Lander's T, but I know I'm not threatened by it, and any damage on it is good, so I go for the Ice Punch, but he's going to predict that and go Magnezone. Now, Magnezone is only going to do 19% here with Volt Switch. Spoiler alert, I am Assault Vest, so that, that means he's Scarf, and I get some more chip on Ferrothorn. Great. I'm going to go Garchomp here as a mid-ground, and here's why. The main idea was, if he goes Ferrothorn, and for some reason he goes for Spikes, I can still kill it with Fire Blast, and he doesn't know that I'm mixed yet. A Jack Pack might give it away, because it likely would be paired with Draco Meteor, but it's really some uncharted territory. It's not a set you see very often, and I can Fire Blast toast Ferrothorn, or just get Rocks up. But, on the flip side... I feel like if he's going to switch out, it's going to be something that does well against Magnezone. The Landorus team makes a lot of sense, and seeing he's like more offensive than not, Draco Meteor can do a nice 55-60% to it. Stealth Rock can come up, and also, if it's a Jolly variant, there's a chance, um, since I'm minus Special Defense, not minus Physical Defense, or if he's maybe more defensive with Stealth Rock and it's just like a weird combine playable, I could live two Earthquakes, and I, I could see if he's Rocks, because if he just goes Earthquake straight up, he's probably just a Swords Dance variant, so it can kind of give me more information, get me Rocks, which can come and play it here as well, and some Chip as well. So ultimately here, I do like to go for the Rocks, and it, it does go up. He gets a crit with Earthquake, which is pretty unfortunate, as given that roll, um, if you got like a lower roll, there's a chance you could live another Earthquake, but also it puts me in range of things like Flash Cannon from Scarf Magnezone, which again, we knew he's Scarf, or Body Push, slash Power Up, slash Jar Ball, all of them from Ferrothorn, didn't kill, and now 
Um, the stab attacks kill, body press probably roll. Even things like dual wing beat from Dragonite suddenly start killing me and knock off from Weavile, which it didn't kill before because I didn't have an item anymore. So yeah, that's a little unfortunate, but I still want to make the most of the situation. I don't want to forfeit my, man my momentum, so I want to get that chip with Draco. And I just go for that here, knowing fully well that it also probably means that roll, since it was all crit that only did 70, is probably a Jolly Swords Dance Landorus T, which actually is going to be important because that means it's quicker than my Dragonite, which is Jolly Dragon Dance. So comes into play there as well. Anyway, he predicts my Draco there, which is a great play, and goes Fable. So I just go my Metal here as he goes for his own rocks, and that kind of just says, okay, yeah, that's what his team is. I go Earthquake there, predicting the Magnezone, and he goes Dragonite predicting that. He goes for an Earthquake of his own. At this point, we're basically trading. Now, my Mel Metal probably looked a little bit better than his Dragonite in this game because I can always revenge kill Dragonite with something like Ice Shard. But at the same time, I don't really have a great switch into it. Unfortunately, because of the dual wing beat, uh, sorry, because of Earthquake crit, I was in range of Earthquake with my Garchomp. So I would have liked to switch to it initially, but unfortunately, that wasn't a possibility here. So I took what was in front of me. Now, this does make Clefable a little bit more annoying. Sorry about that, just had to take some water, but it does make Clefable a bit more annoying because my metal is no longer around to, tra to check it, of course, as this puts it in Magnus and range to just Volt Switch out and take a kill. But also, as we'll see later, I lack a Steel type move on my Magnezone, and my Kartana can be trapped, can be taken advantage of by Ferrothorn, so I have to play very well around Clefable at this point, making it so despite me getting a kill and him not getting a kill in this trade, it probably favored him a little bit there. So I'd argue that made the crit a little bit disadvantageous, but also if he was a Roost Dragonite, then the best it could have bought me was probably just um, probably just a free switch to Weavile or just spamming Draco until I died and getting Weavile in. But, you know, you, you got to be careful against Roost Dragonite anyway. So it wasn't like something that really flipped the game. In my eyes, this was basically a standard line procedure. It was going to happen eventually one way or another. So I was fine with it. Wasn't great, wasn't horrible, but Garrity's playing a really great game so far as he takes advantage of that position, as I said before, and gets the trap, putting us in a 5 to 5 position, getting in his Clefable. Yeah, as I said, that's going to kind of be the big threat here, but I can still bluff a Magnezone with a steel move. He doesn't know that. So I double the Garchomp here, and he is going to go to Magnezone of his own, but I know he's Scarf at this point, so I'm actually just going to go ahead and say, if you want to take the kill with Flash Cannon, it's fine. I can trap you with my own Magnezone, and that opens up the door for a ton of things in my team. So I go for an Earthquake here. And that Earthquake reveals that he's probably going to be the uh, Clefable spread, specifically designed to eat two modest spec Shadow Balls from Dragapult and two Freeze Drives from Curum, while still living things like bulky um, Landorus T Earthquake, um, even after a knockoff. There's a, like, it's like um, 100 and, 160, 156 defense. I've been using it since our Shifu meta because it also lived two Wicked Blows. It's been a common thread for a while now. It's like 100 plus special defense, something like that. Um, but yeah, that Earthquake showed that, which is pretty important here. At this point, I go Magnezone. Again, I can still bluff having the steel move, which is pretty important. Especially because he's probably in that kind of mindset because he's own Magnezone's that way. Now here, I really wish I went for a different attack than I did. I went for Body Press, predicting maybe a Ferrothorn or Magnezone switch on a Flash Cannon. And he went to Landorus T. I wish, I wish, I wish I clicked Toxic or Double Switch to Weavile. Unfortunately, he got in for free here and kind of cornered me, which really great play on his end. So what I can do here is I'm just going to have to toss out my Garchomp, I believe, putting me in a less favorable position. Um, and his Landorus T is also going to heal up the rocks damage as well with two rounds of leftovers. So that's not great here. I am able to get Weavile in now as he goes Ferrothorn. And I believe my Ice Crash is going to do just under 25, which leaves him at 26. And that's not great. So I go Magnezone here and he just doubles the Clefable. And I'm like, damn, great plays by Gary here. I can get a Thunderbolt off. He wishes. That's fine with me. I'm just going to go for an Iron Defense just trying to, you know, maybe threaten him a little bit. He does 21 with the Moon Blast, which isn't great. But um, I'm knowing that he might not be like in the best position. I want to basically force a recovery turn. He goes Moonblast there. So now I force a soft boiled. So what I can do here is I can go Dragonite and basically trade with the Clefable. Dragonite is EV to live Moonblast into Moonblast, I think. This is like 50 or 56 HP or something like that. So yeah. Yeah, the first one does 33. So yeah, it's roughly a roll. On um, my roost here, just trying to see what I can get out of him. Forcing a lower roll. And yeah, 33 again. I think I roost until it does under 33, just to make it like in my favor. But I do have some bulk, which is kind of excuse the dynamic in my favor. I just keep roosting there. I know eventually um, I'm going to run a roost, but yeah, he does 31 down. I'm like, okay, I'm safe. So now I go for the dual wing beat, and I know it's spread basically. So again, a dual wing beat's always going to took you. I, he does 63 there, yeah, as expected. And now here's an interesting turn. See, I rolled slightly below average on dual wing beat, I believe. And Earthquake, I probably should have caught more thoroughly, but Earthquake from this range, it was like uh, 43 to 50... 44 to 52 or 43 to 52 would like the range i went for earthquake here thinking okay looking at his team here I, it has to be iron head or gyro ball on Barathorn. i'm thinking gyro ball makes more sense it's not thunder wave 
on this team in all likelihood because he's Rocky Helmet, um, Spikes, you know, type of set. It kind of just in and out. So Gyro Ball makes more sense. You can't really fit Thunder Wave on that. Um, cause I'm looking at this team and Common and Clefable just cleans him out. Um, obviously, Magazone with Scarf isn't going to be able to beat it. Once you get one combined up, you can basically roost off the soft boil off the, the damage there. So, like, you know, he's probably going to go Ferrothorn knowing that if I roost here, that's fine with him because he could just gyro ball and when I'm plus one speed that's gonna out damage me anyway So I can't actually beat it and if I go for dual wing beat it dies So I figured earthquake was a pretty good play because it was favorable to kill It was kind of even to kill the cliff anyway I don't know if it's favorable is probably like a 50 50 60 40 year old type of thing and um, Honestly, I regret that I'm, I'm just telling you I regret the hell of this because if I had an extra fodder in the late game I probably could have spun the game a bit more in my favor and unfortunately he's gonna just stomach this at like four or five percent I did get absolute min there, but don't let that distract me. He lived at 5%, not at like 1 HP. So like, I'm not crying about this. Like, he had very realistic odds of living that. And that's fine. Um, if I went for Dueling Beat, it always would have killed. But there's always 10% chance to miss. And the fact that he might go Ferrothorn. He definitely caught me there, though. I think he made the right play anyway. Because realistically speaking, you don't need Clefable when it's like at half health. Weavile, you're not going to stomach Weavile always anyway. Cartana, I mean, I guess you can block a Sacred Sword, so if you got Landers to do that anyway. So yeah, I think that Gary made the right play, and maybe I made a little bit of an overprediction here. Definitely a turn where he came out on top, though, being able to kill the Dragonite without being killed there. So that's a huge, um, huge play for him. So what I do here is I go Cartana, and I go for Sacred Sword, um, and knowing right now here that I get a kill there, and then on top of that, I can hopefully try and bait the Scarf Magnezone into maybe get like a Volt Switch, thinking he's quicker than me, or Steel Beam if he has that, into me. Point being that he thinks he's quicker than me, Scarf Cartana's not common. And thankfully, that does work out. And maybe a little bit of an aggressive play there by Gary, but I'm going to reap the rewards of that, which is huge. Now, here he goes, Landorus T. Now, this is big. So, I actually thought about this guy. I know he's Sword Dance, but I'm thinking about it more and more. And sub here, I, I wasn't sure if it was sub. If he's sub, if he's got sub, he's going to click it here. But I don't really have a great play, because if I click Sacred Sword and he's subbed, then I could basically bring him down low, I could um, eat the Earthquake, and then Sacred Sword plus Sub plus next Sacred Sword should take him out, given that I'm plus one, and then I would just win the game with this. But on the flip side, if he um, if he clicks Earthquake as I click Sacred Sword, then all of a sudden I'm in like range of Ice Shard after Stealth Rock plus potential Iron Bars, and I can just lose to Weavile. And also, I don't know that he's Sub. He might just Earthquake. So instinctually speaking, I'm like, well, since I don't have Triple Axe on my Weavile, which really probably cost me here because if i had triple axe i might have had a shot um it really kind of made this a funky turn so what i do here is i just i go to magazine praying that he's not substitute or he goes for earthquake anyway and unfortunately he does go for subs he's gonna get a kill with me behind the sub there's nothing i can do to stop that um he goes for earthquake here i think swords dance was his better play by him but i guess he was still scared of the flash cannon because i bluffed it so many times before i i didn't have it clicking by press there probably gave it away before but i didn't have it so if he went for swords dance he could have just um Actually, he probably was so scared of the triple axle, so it didn't matter. That's why. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter then. Um. Anyway, at this point here, I go for Cartana, and I know I got to click Leaf Blade. Leaf Blade um, takes us out, and now, given that Earthquake damage, he's probably jolly, but he also still uh, might not be, like, super bulky. So, Leaf Blade has a chance to kill off the leftovers, so I didn't mean it 69%, just because Cartana's that strong. So, this becomes a weighted 50-50, in that if I go to Weavile and he goes Ferrothorn, I can kill that, and then kind of force it into a bit of a... Um, interesting late game because after stealth rock ice shard doesn't really always kill cartana in fact i think it favors me um i don't have the calculus on my head so if i go to weavile on that then i'm golden but if he risks the roll and he gets the roll and my leaf blade um doesn't kill this and he just kills me then all of a sudden i have weavile against all three of these pokemon and i, I it still comes down to weavile right so what was i saying I lost my turn. Wait a sec. Okay, here we go. This is the 50-50. I'm sorry. Oh boy, I should have taken a second take there. <laughs> That's fine. So if I Leaf Blade and he stays in, even if I don't kill him, I have a chance at winning with Weavile. Albeit, it's a weakened 72% Weavile versus 100% Weavile, so I might have to get a flinch or win a speed die here and there, but the point being that it's very doable. However, if I click Leaf Blade into Ferrothorn, I eat... Barbs. Barbs means that Ice Shard's always going to kill me. Right now, even if I switch out and take rocks, I'm living Ice Shard almost always. And from this range, I'm always living Ice Shard besides a crit. So, right now, I'm in like a position where if he stays in, or for some reason goes Weavile, which I'll never do, I'm in great shape. 
or at least the best shape I can be in this matchup. But if he goes Ferrothorn Leap Blade, the game's basically over unless I get very lucky. Now, on the flip side, um, if I stay in and I get the roll with Leap Blade, which I don't know what his HP investment was, so I don't want to speak on his behalf. If I kill there, then all of a sudden, he has to go Ferrothorn. And if Ferrothorn, um, because before he didn't go to it, so I'm thinking it was probably power up as his main attack. I could potentially go Kartan on that. It really depends or I could just lock into Sacred Sword, but then Ice Shard, you know, it really depends on the moves, but it would have given me a chance is the point. But meanwhile, if he goes Ferrothorn and I switch to Weavile, I switch to Weavile there, I get the kill, then I haven't taken any barbs on Kartana and the Ferrothorn's dead, which is huge for me because I can sweep the game with Leaf Blade after Stealth Rocks potentially. Because Stealth Rock and Landorus T, plus the fact that I'll get a Beast Boost kill on Kartana, means that it'll negate Intimidate, and then I win the game. So if I get Weavile in there and the Ferrothorn, that's huge. Alternatively, if I go Weavile on Earthquake, he kills me, he gets more leftovers, and the game just ends. I, I can't beat the last three. I take Iron Barbs twice, and that'd be that. So, ultimately, what happens is here, it's a weighted 50-50. I think he's going to stay in, because I think he has some bulk, given the Earthquake damages from before, coupled with the fact that, um, I don't know, I feel like he's in, like, if I go Weavile on Ferrothorn, then I kind of have, like, a, a favorable shot to win, and I don't, I think that's the only way that happens, so... Maybe he's playing his odds, but also Gary can see like, oh, Finch is going to expect that and stay in. And I think that's ultimately what it came down to. And he made that right play. Now, again, I think that like if you take like the net outcome of every single thing, he's probably still favored here. And I do want to note, I rolled really low on the second lead plate here, but it didn't actually matter. Like the game was over at this point, barring hacks, because I would have to um here. So here I can go ahead here. And now my, basically my win condition at this point is. Now, I don't know why I went Weavile over Landers T. That's something I didn't get. I think his play was go Landorus T and just Earthquake me. But maybe I just a little attack investment that it didn't always kill. I'm not sure. But even that Ice Shard, yeah, I don't know. I think he had to go Landorus T there. But that aside, um, I would have had to get a flinch here. Or win the speed tie in the next turn and then get the flinch there. And neither of those happened. He won the speed tie. Now, obviously, my Ice School Crash wasn't going to kill there. Barring a quick lit. So, he was strongly favored as a point. And Gary was able to win that game. 2-0 in a super tight camp down the wire game i feel like if um if i had the extra fodder there or maybe i played guard a bit differently i would have had better shape honestly though um i think i had a good matchup here and gary just made the right plays going to landers team the body press was great um getting the ferrothorn on the cartana in there well maybe it was like a weighted 50 50 he made the right play for himself and that really worked and he put himself in the winning position so very well played by gary making great work with that scarf magnus on as well um, even if it kind of died in an untimely fashion, it kind of revealed my set, which helped him there with the Landers T-Sub. And that opened up the game. Great set pick on them with Sub Landers T in a really close, really fun game. I don't love um, losing, obviously. It was tough to lose. I felt like my team was really great, but I don't think I made any big mistakes. And I think the game was super close and it was super fun. And don't worry, I'll get my wins in my next games. I promise you that much when I bring you those. But this was just a really fun game. And I'm always happy bringing you guys a loss because losses are filled with learning moments and experiences that can turn future losses potentially into wins. So that's what we're going to focus on here. And that's what's great. So going to my next games next two days, I knew I was going to be motivated to bring those back. But in, for this game, Gary got the better of me here. Really well played game. Really fun game. I brought a fun team. He brought a fun team. That's what you love to see. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Um, tell me what you guys think of the game down below. And I hope you all have a great day. All right. Talk to you later. Thank you so much for watching. Bye, guys.